Hello everyone, my name is uh, Maxim Kukrel and today I'm very proud to be here uh, in front of you to talk a little about a uh, threat model and about how you can improve your Kubernetes security posture with threat model. I will try to share my experience, my feedback uh, about that. A quick introduction about myself. I'm a principal Kubernetes cloud security uh, architect at RBC. RBC is a Royal Bank of uh, Canada. I have the pleasure to, to lead a, a team of uh, amazing uh, Kubernetes security architects. I'm also very engaged with the tech community because I'm a, a recognized as a Microsoft MVP. Uh, MVP is a Microsoft community program for people passionate about cloud, about technology uh, in general. I'm also a, a tech blogger. I'm also an open source contributor. Uh, you can follow me on LinkedIn or uh, on uh, X uh, if you want. If you have any question, uh, I will take the question at the end of this presentation. But uh, if you have any question after this presentation, uh, do not hesitate to, to reach me. Uh, if I can um, try to answer to your question, uh, that will be my, uh, my pleasure about that. A quick disclaimer, any of your opinion expressed in this presentation, it's only my opinion and not necessarily the opinion of, of my uh, current uh, employer, its ownership management or its employee. Now to bring everyone uh, up to speed, uh, just would like to do just a quick introduction about, uh, about the Kubernetes architecture. What you need to understand in this case, in this slide, is we have two main components. The first main component, that is a control plane, that is like the, the brain of Kubernetes. And in this, uh, in this control plane, you have one uh, main component, the API server, and you have also an ETCD cluster to store uh, all the configuration, all the Kubernetes secrets, and you have a scheduler to orchestrate uh, the different uh, containers in addition of a control manager. And on the right, on my slide, you have also a data plane. The data plane, that is a part where you have the uh, Kubernetes node. And we have uh, three main components. In this case, we have the kubelet, the kube proxy, and the container runtime. I hope it's, uh, it's, go it's good for everyone. As you know, Kubernetes is very, it's a very complex uh, topic. We have a ton of Kubernetes security challenge. I highlighted some security challenge uh, to you specifically uh, from the uh, OWASP uh, top 10 for Kubernetes. Uh, from my experience, what is very complicated to do with Kubernetes is uh, all the subjects related to uh, identity, how you manage airbag configuration inside uh, a Kubernetes cluster, um, and also in terms of uh, network segmentation, how you will apply a great uh, network segmentation between your different application, or you will do uh, a multi-tenancy cluster. A uh, lot of organization, from my experience, uh, have mistake about that, and they try to uh, they try to address this uh, different type of uh, of uh, challenge. But now, if we step back, I believe it's important to step back and to understand the full process when uh, when an organization want to release a new cloud pattern. A new cloud pattern could be a new application you will uh, you will migrate from on-prem to cloud, or just a new application you will build uh, from scratch directly uh, for the cloud. And um, Lot of regulated, or a lot of regulated organizations are following this, uh, this framework. The first thing we will uh, do, it's a security review. We will uh, review uh, the different uh, cloud services, and we will try to uh, identify all the uh, best practice in terms of security we should apply to have uh, cloud services uh, configure, uh, configure uh, uh, from, a, from a secure way. Uh, for example, if you have a storage bucket, maybe you want to not have this storage bucket public, you want maybe to uh, enable encryption in transit with TLS 1.2. You have a ton of uh, recommendation, you have a ton of recommendation and security parameter to address. And in this document, the goal of that, the, the main goal is to, is to do that. And it's also to identify which security control uh, based on the threat you will, uh, you will discover in this review, which security control you should to apply. Uh, for example, if you are in Azure, you will apply Azure policy. If you are in AWS, you have maybe some uh, AWS config. Or if you are uh, with, uh, with a Kubernetes application, in this case, you will create a security control based, uh, based on uh, OPA policy or Kiverno policy, uh, for example. The next step after that 
is to do a threat model because it's great to have a full uh, overview of your uh, of your uh, of your application, of your infrastructure, and to understand the different uh, the different threats. Uh, that is the subject of this presentation. Uh, and a lot of organizations have their own cloud control validation. Uh, that is their internal uh, cloud security uh, framework. Uh, if you don't have that and you, you begin your journey with, uh, with cloud in this case, uh, you have some uh, cloud security alliance matrix available and you can try to, to use that to build your own standard uh, in this case. Or if you are migrated a regulated application, for example, an application with, uh, with compliance, uh, specifically, for example, PCI DSS, if you are in the credit card, uh, in the credit card industry. Uh, in this case, you will have some specific control uh, to assess specifically uh, for this regulation. The next one is Pendesk, because it's Always good. To, uh, it's always uh, good to have an external uh, an external opinion about your about about your application. And sometimes we try to just pen test only the application side. But uh, in my in my recommendation, I will recommend you to to do a pen test of the infrastructure. And when your infrastructure uh, your Kubernetes infrastructure is completely are done, in this case, after that, you can do uh, an applica an application pen test because it's very good to have a strong application. But in reality, if you have a lot of weaknesses in your infrastructure uh, for an attacker, that will be a, a game over if I can say that. And after that, you have, you, you have uh, the need to have a scorecard. A scorecard, it's uh, like an IT risk opinion, uh, because as you know, not all the applications are secure at 100%. It's impossible uh, to do that. You still have some risk, and you need to know, you need to know your risk, because you need to identify um, a risk score based on your uh, risk appetites. And finally, at the end, you have a, a cloud governance board in large organization. Uh, that is a board with technical people, with executive people, sometimes with application people. And uh, all the findings discovered uh, acro uh, across this process will be presented. And at the end, they will take the decision if it's right or not to move this application to the cloud. And, uh, and what is also very important in this case, in this type, in this type of cloud governance board, is uh, to highlight the, uh, the different risk, uh, the different risk discovered uh, discover during this process, and uh, and this risk should be uh, in, cor in correlation with the, with the risk appetite uh, of the organization. But in this presentation, I will focus only on threat model and more specifically on Kubernetes uh, threat model. But the first question you can ask me, and you can say to me, hey, Max, why we are conducting a threat model? Because at the end, it's just an action. And why we are doing that? I believe that is very important to, to know why we are doing that. Because sometimes that is, uh, is not very uh, well understood by, uh, by the business and by, by the developer. Sometimes they think it's only an additional step created by the security. <laughs> and uh, that will uh, slowly their uh, deployment process. But in reality, it's important to identify and, and to know your security risk. Uh, as I said before, it's impossible to have an application secure at 100%. Uh, you will still have some uh, zero days, some uh, new, uh, new threat, but it's important to, to, highlight, uh, to highlight that and to know your weaknesses. Because if you know the weaknesses of your platform, of your uh, application in this case, you can focus more of your time and the time of your security team on, this, uh, on these different weaknesses. Maybe you will create some mitigation strategy uh, to address this different, uh, this different risk. It's also very important to, uh, to do that, as I said before, for compliance and, and, and regulation, uh, specifically for, uh, for uh, financial uh, organization. Uh, you have, uh, we have a regulator, and they ask for this type of document. And also, it's also important to, to be prepared for, uh, for incidence response, because if you, know, if you don't know very well your application, your infrastructure, and you don't know the weaknesses of this application of, or your infrastructure, you will be not ready to, uh, to have a, a great incident response process in place because at the end, every, everyone will say, OK, this application is hosted in which cluster, which version, are using which solution. And at the end, uh, if you don't have this deep dive knowledge, you will lose a lot of time and you will be, uh, you will be not uh, ready to address this type of, uh, of concern. And overall, uh, when you increase the security posture of your, your, uh, your application, your platform, uh, you will uh, improve the uh, system resilience. 
as you know, few methodology exist to do, uh, to do a threat modeling. I identify three major uh, methodology, uh, the threat methodology. Uh, in this case, this methodology is based uh, to assign a score to each different uh, factor. And we have also uh, the stride methodology. The focus of the stride methodology is more in an uh, attack-based uh, methodology and also uh, the PASTA methodology. Um, now, if you, if you explore the market and if you, uh, if you talk with, uh, with some of your coworkers, a lot of people are using stride or dread uh, in terms of, uh, in term of uh, threat modeling methodology. But now, if we step back, it's also important to know your threat actor because you will not deploy the same type of security control. Uh, you will not have the same uh, type of, of, uh, of threat uh, in function of the different uh, threat actor. Uh, some threat actor could be some end user. Uh, some other threat actor could be some uh, internal attacker. Um, now, if you, if, you, if you follow the news, you will see a lot of attack are coming now from, uh, from insider, from people directly inside of your company. Maybe you have, uh, you have an insider in your cloud ops team, in your SRE team, and you don't know that. And also, uh, from, what we, uh, from what we can see, uh, we see a lot of uh, activists and also a lot of uh, organized, organized crime. And after that, in, in, that will also depend about uh, about uh, what is your core business, but uh, sometimes you can have some uh, foreign, uh, foreign intelligence services, uh, some nation state will try to, uh, to attack you to, uh, to steal some information about your customer or to steal some information about your, uh, about your different um, uh, solution. Here I highlighted some uh, example of threat uh, for uh, for a Kubernetes uh, for a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, that is very an high level mapping. Uh, as you can see, you, we, we will identify this threat in function of the different assets. The asset that will be the different component of the uh, of the Kubernetes uh, of the Kubernetes cluster. You know, uh, the for example, etcd that is uh, one of sensitive uh, component of uh, Kubernetes that where you will store some configuration. Sometimes if you are using uh, a Kubernetes secret, you will store the Kubernetes secret in, in ETCD. Uh, maybe by default uh, is not uh, encrypted. Uh, I will give you an example. Uh, if you are using Azure Kubernetes services, you know, uh, by default, this ETCD component is managed by Microsoft because the control plane, uh, the control plane is managed by Microsoft. And if you want to encrypt this ETCD with your own uh, custom managed key, uh, that is a new feature that was released uh, only a few months ago. Uh, before that, that was not possible. That was encrypted by Microsoft, but if you want to add an additional layer in terms of encryption, uh, right now you can, uh, you can do that. And you know, from my experience, I believe it's, uh, it's a mistake to uh, start uh, a threat model directly from scratch uh, and start directly to do uh, a stride or dread uh, methodology from scratch. That's the reason why we uh, have implemented another methodology. That's the methodology I will, uh, recommend, I will, I will share with you uh, today. Uh, in this case, for us, what is important to do, the first thing is to do an architecture analysis. After that, an access control mapping. Uh, we will review the data security, the logging, the logging and monitoring part, the compute network and security, the different security control you have uh, across, uh, across your, uh, your cloud pattern. Uh, we will talk also about uh, compliance and threat and risk at the end. Why we are doing an architecture analysis? It's from my opinion and from my experience, it's very challenging to, uh, to start a threat model if you don't understand very well the organization. Uh, the, the, not the organization, sorry. Uh, if you don't understand very well uh, the application and the platform. And for that, uh, what we, uh, what we uh, have created in this case is like a form with some, uh, some assessment question. And we will uh, schedule a meeting with the application team or with, and, uh, with, uh, with the enforcement structure team and we will ask this type of, uh, of question and that will bring uh, everyone up to speed with the same level of uh, with the same level of knowledge and that is very important because you know 
all these different architectures are very complex. Uh, sometimes it's multi-cloud architecture. Sometimes you have also some uh, some different dependency between uh, between application. If, and if you don't have this uh, right understanding, uh, you will be not uh, ready to create a great threat model because your understanding will be not great. And to create this uh, architecture analysis question, uh, we have uh, used an existing, uh, an existing form, and we have tweaked this form, uh, uh, offered by Microsoft. Uh, if you're interested to, to know more about that, the name is a Microsoft Fast Track for Azure Architecture Review, and that will uh, help you to, uh, to do that. In addition of that, as I said before, one weaknesses of a lot of Kubernetes cluster is access control. Because you know you will have some cloud identity, you will, you will have also, in addition of that, some uh, Kubernetes, uh, some Kubernetes uh, identity. Uh, in terms of cloud identity, if I reuse and, uh, and Microsoft Azure example, in this case, you can have some service principle, some uh, managed identity, but you will not have the same, uh, the same type of, uh, of threats related to these different identity. Same thing, maybe your uh, Kubernetes application use a service account, a Kubernetes service account, and you uh, will have also some different threats related to that. And what is very important, and what I recommend in this case, is to list uh, from your knowledge and from the knowledge of the different team, uh, all the uh, all the different identity, and try to map the uh, try to map the interaction between the different identity. Uh, you can create a, a table like like this one. It's it, it's very easy to do that. You have provider, application components, uh, the role associated uh, to the identity, the type of identity, because you will, as I said, you will not have the same uh, the same security control uh, for this for, for 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 this type of identity. Uh, I can give you another example. In this case, for example, if you have uh, your application hosted on Azure and you are using Service Principle, okay, uh, by default. Uh, you don't have a, a conditional access uh, policy in place for service principle if you don't have a Microsoft Intra ID P2. Uh, that means you will be not be able to uh, define uh, an allow list to say, okay, only this pool of, of public IP can use my service principle. You know, in AWS, when you have an IAM policy, uh, you have also this type of uh, condition, this type of, of condition. That means if someone from your team or someone from uh, uh, someone who know as a service principal, he can use this service principal and usurp the identity from uh, his personal inter internet connection and access to your infrastructure. Uh, that is only uh, an example. And the challenge with identity, you know, when you have static identity like, 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 like this one, uh, is uh, the rotation. Because you have, when you have key, you should rotate your key. And you should rotate your key very often. Um, and after that, for the data security, it's also important to, uh, to do a, a data flow uh, in your uh, threat model document. Because what we want to do in this case is we want to map uh, all the, all the uh, data interaction between, uh, between the different uh, components and try to identify, to identify uh, which risk could apply for, uh, for which interaction. And in answer to that, uh, which control I should to put in place. For example, I can give you another example. If we have an Azure SQL database, uh, you want to have all the communication uh, in transit encrypted with TLS 1.2 1, 1 or TLS 1.3. Uh, you want maybe to, uh, to, uh, to enforce uh, uh, field level encryption uh, at the database level, uh, all this type of, of, uh, of control. Logging and monitoring, that is also another big piece um, because you know, Specifically, if you are leveraging Kubernetes in uh, in the cloud, because you should to collect log from the cloud provider, and also in addition of that, the log directly from uh, from the Kubernetes uh, from the Kubernetes platform. A lot of people will collect the log. They will store the log for forever. <laughs> that is also a risk about that. And also, in addition of that, when you have logs, it's great. But if you don't have an engine uh, to search uh, inside this log, uh, that will be also uh, something challenging when you will have uh, when you will have an incident. And uh, also, uh, what is very important with all this log is to build. 
uh, to build security use case to detect abnormal uh, behavior. You know, for example, if you have an application and this application try to, to do uh, internal port scanning, you want to detect that. You want to be highlighted about that. You want to have a security alert generated to your SOC, uh, to your SOC team about that because maybe your application is potentially compromised. Uh, but in, the, in, the, in, in this case, specifically in this case for, this, uh, for, for a threat model, it's also your responsibility to, uh, when you do an architecture review, to, uh, to be sure all, all these uh, different log and all this level of log are enabled. And also when you will uh, identify some threat about that, uh, a very good practice is to identify which uh, SOC runbook uh, you should to create, or maybe you have already created this sock book, identify to, uh, to, this, uh, to this potential threat. Uh, specifically, uh, if that is a threat you can't resolve, uh, in this case, it's very important to have detection about that. Now, if we talk about uh, compute, uh, compute and network security, uh, and network security. Uh, also in the threat model, uh, my recommendation is to do a network matrix. Uh, same thing of what, we, what I have already explained to, uh, to the data flow. In this case, it's very great to uh, have, uh, to have uh, a, net, uh, a network flow in this case. Uh, to map the interaction between the different components, uh, the different control, and also uh, the different uh, gap about that. Uh, I don't specify that in, the, in this slide, but the compute part, uh, that is also uh, something very important to take that uh, in consideration, specifically if you uh, have a Kubernetes use case in the cloud. I can give you an example, uh, another example with, uh, with Azure Kubernetes services in this case. Um, it's great to, to, to receive update, but you know, if you don't have a process to uh, rotate and recycle your different uh, Kubernetes node, uh, at the end you will have maybe some uh, persistent malicious, uh, malicious uh, uh, script uh, on the node and you will, uh, you will know that. A good practice in this case is recycle your node and for that you need to have a process to drain the, no to drain the pod uh, from one node to another node. But if you don't have this, uh, this type of thread and you don't have identified this type of thread in the thread model, you, maybe your SRE team or your cloud ops team will never know that. And, uh, and, uh, and if something happens, uh, that will be too late. And uh, yeah, and in terms of gap, what I have highlighted in this case, I have highlighted two major gaps. A lot of organization have, have, uh, have this gap is uh, Jumbox session recording. Is, that is for your, uh, for your admin because uh, when your admin are, are doing a kubectl, uh, a kubectl, uh, a kubectl command, uh, uh, sometimes they maybe are doing that directly from their own uh, from their own uh, laptop. The same laptop they will use to access to uh, to their to their uh, email, and maybe this laptop is compromised. Uh, you don't know. Uh, sometimes they, this laptop have extend, extend, extended permission. And a good recommendation in this case is to have a dedicated a dedicated gem box only for uh, administration task, and also to have recording about uh, to record all the activity. Uh, will uh, will happen on this uh, different uh, gem box, and you know I put another uh, another tr another thread related to uh, to Azure Kubernetes services is when you uh, deploy an Azure Kubernetes services uh, cluster, uh, you have no choice to uh, to open um, some network connectivities uh, to uh, to external sources like uh, NTP. Uh, to, to have the time, for example, in this case. And, uh, and for that, you, you should to have a, a connectivity uh, you, to, to an Azure Firewall. And uh, maybe you don't have, uh, maybe in your organization, you don't have a, a DLP, a DLP inspection on this, uh, on this type of, uh, of traffic. And that could be a way uh, to, exfiltrate, uh, to exfiltrate data if someone has proof as a, uh, NTP, uh, the NTP address. And uh, that's all for that. Uh, that's all for me for uh, computer network security. Uh, now, if we talk about security control, you know, uh, that is also uh, a huge topic in terms of uh, Kubernetes because uh, 
as you have uh, security control in force uh, in, in your Azure or AWS environment with Azure policy or AWS config, uh, in this case, it's very great to have also security control in force inside your Kubernetes cluster because maybe you don't want to have your, uh, your, uh, your application uh, team uh, to allow them to run a container as root or to run container with privilege. Maybe you want to, uh, you want to enforce a resource limit. And to do that, you have multiple choices to do that. You can leverage OPA Gatekeeper. A lot of organizations uh, are doing that. Or you can you leverage a competitor, uh, in this case, uh, Kiverno. Or if you have um, time and you have a uh, high skill, uh, high skill uh, um, security team, you can create your own admission controller. That is also, uh, that is also another, another option. I put some example of uh, Kubernetes security control, uh, but uh, that is uh, only a few examples. If you have any question about that, uh, let me know. And in addition of that, I will add, you know, uh, some people said to me, Max, hey, I have security control enforced in my Kubernetes cluster, but in reality, the security control are enforced only in, um, in warning mode and not in deny mode. Uh, that reality is that will only generate an alert when something happens. But um, from my experience, when you have thousands and thousands of alerts at the end, no one will watch that. Uh, that's what it's important to, uh, what it, what, what it's important to have uh, uh, security control enforced in deny mode uh, from day one. It's very complicated to apply security control when you have already an existing uh, Kubernetes cluster, you have already some, uh, some application onboarded in, uh, inside this, uh, this, uh, this Kubernetes cluster because that will create some friction uh, with, uh, with, a different, uh, with a different team. But that is also a great recommendation uh, I will share with you. Uh, when your uh, SRE team deploy a new Kubernetes cluster, uh, the security control should come from day one directly with a minimum baseline. And after that, you will extend or you will create customization on this baseline. But that, sh that uh, should be from day one. You know, in your threat model, if I uh, step back and uh, on, the, on the threat model, uh, sometimes when you have uh, regulatory compliance, uh, as I said before about, for example, PCI DSS, or if you have uh, GDPR compliance, if you have uh, um, a workload in, uh, in Europe, in this case, uh, you will have also some requirement. Uh, you will have some requirement, for example, with PCI DSS to have minimum TLS 1.2 enforced across all your different, uh, all your different application. Uh, that is also very important to highlight that, uh, to highlight that in, your, uh, in, in your threat model. And now you will say, you will say me, hey, Max. <laughs> You, you talk about threat, threat, threat uh, since uh, 25 minutes right now. Uh, but how I can have an holistic view about that. Uh, and for that, we Microsoft created a threat landscape uh, specifically for Kubernetes. And that will give you some, uh, that will give you some idea about um, about some potential attacks uh, based on the MITRE. Uh, they, are use, they, they use the MITRE framework uh, to do that. And uh, uh, you, you, will, uh, you will be aware about, about, the, about the new technique. And finally, only at the end, after all these steps, I will recommend you to do, uh, to do uh, the threat and risk mapping. And in this case, that is an example uh, wh where uh, we use uh, the, dread the dread methodology to do, uh, to do that. Uh, it's, in, this case is, in this case, it's only at the end when you have already done all these different steps. Uh, when you will start to do this exercise, you will have a very, very uh, good understanding about the different uh, network flow, data flow, other about the, about the uh, architecture analysis. And that will be uh, very relevant in this case for you to, uh, to identify uh, the potential threat uh, for your platform and your application. As you know, this methodology is not perfect. Uh, I highlighted some area of improvement. Uh, the first one is to incorporate threat intelligence feed because uh, as you know, Kubernetes and specifically Kubernetes security, uh, it's a topic and this topic is moving very, very, uh, very fast. And it's, uh, you know, sometimes if you have a threat, if you, if you created your threat model one year ago is 
uh, I can guarantee at 100% is outdated. And I will recommend you to uh, update that uh, often. And if you have any, if you, if you can use any threat intelligence feeds uh, from different sources, uh, that will um, that will be uh, better for your uh, threat for your uh, for your threat model. Um, one mistake uh, I have already seen uh, in lot of organization is a lot of people think threat model is only for security. It's only a security ex exercise. But from my opinion, that is not true uh, because the threat model should be uh, should be a collaborative uh, effort and should be a, a cross a cross functional team. Uh, it's great to have people with a security mindset, but it's better if you have people with security mindset, with a business mindset, and also uh, someone with a, a dev and ops or, or developer uh, background. Uh, I know it's maybe not possible uh, every time, but uh, if you want to have a good result, uh, to have a cross-functional team, uh, that is one of my recommendations. And as I said before, to do a regular review and, it, and, and uh, iteration. And now, as you know, everyone is uh, talking about AI and about generative AI. And uh, I believe in this case, that is only some research. Uh, from my opinion, it's maybe relevant in this case to use a large language model to uh, automate some, uh, some threat model uh, activity, uh, specifically when you have a pattern recognition. You know, because sometimes you, you will do uh, two different threat models, but you will have the same uh, components. And maybe if you can uh, use, uh, use an AI uh, system like uh, with GPT-4, for example, to try to recognize the same, uh, the same component and try to identify if, if we can reuse the same, uh, the same threat. And also, um, some, uh, uh, if you can uh, uh, really, uh, use uh, NLP, uh, natural language processing, to uh, ingest uh, external, uh, external data uh, from external sources. And also um, about uh, proactive update is, um, you know, if um, a new attack vector is discovered, uh, to have a process to automatically update your, uh, all your threat models, uh, which are vulnerable to this uh, new attack vector. And also for the risk scoring, uh, because that, when you are doing threat model, that is also uh, another challenge is to be, uh, consistent in your uh, risk scoring and to, st to still have the same, uh, the same, the same score uh, between the different uh, threat model. And that, that could be also another use case where AI could be leveraged to do that. In terms of takeaway, uh, with this uh, presentation, I wanted to share uh, with you uh, some topic. What is important is to have a good understanding about the, about the architecture, about the application, uh, and also the different component interaction before to start uh, before to start a threat model. Um, as you know, Kubernetes is moving very fast. They release a ton of new version, a ton of new uh, uh, attack vector are discovered, uh, and it's also very important to have a continuous monitoring in place, uh, specifically uh, or specifically about um, about. Um, about, the, about to have a way to discover, uh, to discover new thread. And for example, if someone do a modification in the Kubernetes threat model, uh, I don't know, uh, create a Kubernetes dashboard and this dashboard will be exposed. Uh, that is a threat maybe you have already catch in your threat model or you will react to that. That is important to take that, uh, to take that in consideration. Uh, that bring me uh, to my uh, third point, review and update the threat model. And also, uh, you know, when you have, uh, when you have maybe uh, some incidents, when incidents happen, uh, sometimes it's also very great to do a post uh, to do a post mortem and to bring the uh, result of this post mortem in the threat model uh, and collaboration. Uh, I will uh, I will close this uh, this uh, this presentation with that. For me, uh, that is a main key of the success. That is a collaboration uh, between between the business stakeholders, the application team, the SRA team, and the security. And to to close this talk for me. And from my opinion, uh, from my opinion, a threat model is not only for security. It's for all these different uh, person. Uh, thank you so much for your time. And if you have any questions. I put some, uh, some reference. Uh, if you want to know more about uh, Kubernetes threat model, uh, the first one was created by the financial uh, user group. And uh, that is a, a threat model specifically for Kubernetes. Uh, 
and also uh, I put also some uh, tree books, uh, very interesting tree books. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the first two are really about, uh, about Kubernetes security, and the last one is more uh, like the, the, the book of reference for threat modeling. Do you have any question? Question? Yes? So the biggest challenge that we've been facing in my company with the security activities like threat modeling or architecture analysis, what to do with that data? What techniques have you found to be successful for being able to put the results of those activities into a common data format and actually look at the security? Yeah, that is a, that is a, very, good, uh, that is a very good question. A lot of people <laughs> have this, uh, this type of question. You know, um, what is great in this case when you have all these different mapping is every time to, to map to a security mitigation or to a, to a security control. Uh, a security control, that is something of, uh, uh, which everyone can understand uh, to create an additional OPA policy, to create, uh, to create an additional Azure policy, and, and to tune the service about that. But, you know, uh, the threat model, it's, that should be uh, one will help to feed the uh, IT scorecard. You know, uh, at the end, all the findings will, uh, will be highlighted in the IT scorecard. Uh, if I come back to my, uh, if I come back to my uh, process, to my framework here, um, perfect. You know, um, the security review, the threat model, the cloud control validation, the result of the pen test, all of this finding will help to define a, a risk score. And, uh, and th this risk code should be in, collab in collaboration uh, and in adequation, maybe, uh, with the risk appetite uh, of the organization. Yeah. You. You're welcome. Any other additional question? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Yes. Me, uh, in my case, uh, I, I will use uh, I will use uh, Stride because Stride is focused on on the attack vector. Uh, that is not the methodology we use uh, for many different uh, reasons. But uh, if you sh if I need to restart from scratch, uh, I will use Stride. Okay, cool. Um, if you don't have any other question. Uh, I will uh, close this uh, presentation and thanks again uh, for your time.